Hello, everybody. Welcome to Common Censored. I am Lee Camp, joined, as always, by Eleanor Goldfield. Hello, hello. This is the show where we talk censored stories and people, sensible solutions, and common ground movements to fight and build. And sometimes other stuff. And we're finally back in the same room together. So that's, <laughs> that's good. That is, that is a new, new thing after a while. <laughs> but uh, it's good to, good to be here. Good to be back. Yeah, it's nice to be at this table. <laughs> It's a, good, it's a good table, solid table. So let's get to um, let's get to a lot of things. But well, to give you a quick preview, we're going to be talking about Bernie Sanders. We're going to be talking about corporate media and the garbage dumpster fire it is. Um, but keep talk- in mind, Lee, this is a Christmas special, so you have to say everything with a kind of positive spirit. Yeah, a kind of <laughs> like sitting by the fireplace with a hot cup of cocoa spin to it. Okay. Uh, well, I'll do some slurping noises as I go. <laughs> Let's talk about how the world is dying. Oh, God, please. Uh. I'm sorry for anyone who has this in their earbuds right now. Uh, I've said that for every episode. <laughs> um, and we're going to talk about how this has been the year of the worker. We, we got a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of cool stuff coming up. Uh, let's let's get into it. Um, so Bernie Sanders and AOC, this is, this is your fairly quick, I'm going to say, three minutes of uh, the soap opera of politics update. <laughs> soap opera of politics that uh, we, we go over at the beginning here. Bernie Sanders and uh, AOC had a massive rally in California in Los Angeles area. Something like 20,000 people came out. Um, they walked, apparently walked out on stage to a music by a Palestinian artist, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and on top of that, California has moved their primary earlier in the season. So it is now more impactful than it used to be, uh, in that less will have been decided by the time California's massive number of delegates come into play. And Bernie Sanders is winning there, which the mainstream media doesn't like to talk about much. Uh, even in their, you know, relatively slanted polls, he's still winning there. Um, and yeah, it, 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 he's got a, he's got a strong chance in all of these states of, of, winning this primary if it weren't for the variety of ways that it's rigged. Um, but it still seems, and I think a lot of, uh, you know, activists out there don't really want to talk about it, but that, uh, the goal of the DNC is to force it to a second vote at the convention and get the super delegates involved and again, steal it from Bernie Sanders. Yeah, and I've I've noticed that they're trying some of the same. When you mentioned the the Palestinian band uh, that they that they the music that they walked out to, it reminded me of some of the same things that we were talking about with regards to Corbin and how he was taken down by false claims of anti-Semitism. There's some of the same thing happening to to Bernie, despite the fact that he is in fact Jewish. <laughs> uh, I saw a tweet the other day that said uh, Sanders might be ethnically Jewish. But his rhetoric is anti-Semitic, and <laughs> so they're, they're, you know, and and to be fair, this obviously ended up working in the UK to brand someone as anti-Semitic simply for standing up for Palestinian rights. You right. know, going to events with Palestinian artists or academics or et cetera, et cetera. All of that is why Corbyn is clearly anti-Semitic is because he dare be in the same room as a Palestinian. Right. So some of the same. You know, it's 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 a it's a similar playbook, and why not? Because it's it's working. So I think uh, you know, not only the things that we we see being having been used against people like Bernie by the Democrats, but also kind of in general against progressive candidates worldwide, uh, these these smears of being anti-Semitic. That that's a hell of a toolkit that they're working with. And. I wasn't thinking about bringing this up, but uh, since we got into the anti-Semitism thing, uh, the other big story this week is uh, on that topic is that Rudolph, Rudolph Giuliani, Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> wow, I got the Christmas. Uh, the see, hey, you see, did. I was, I'm doing my best to get Christmas into each <laughs> and ever, every. Uh, Please tell me that that's actually his name, like on his birth certificate. R- Rudolph? Rudolph. What? What would his name be? I don't know. 
<laughs> Someone find out and let us know. Rudinger. Um, but Giuliani did this, like, you know, kind of borderline tirade thing about how evil George Soros is the puppet master. And, and although I hate this, uh, this, the, where, where people just point to things that, and they're like, those are anti Semitic tropes. People way overuse that. They're like, if you say anything negative about someone who happens to be Jewish, then it's an anti Semitic trope. But, it does seem like he's getting involved in some anti-Semitic tropes here. Soros is not evil because he's Jewish. He's just evil because he's a fucking billionaire who likes trying to purchase the society and run it uh, by putting in his people that will do what he wants. Um, but but then Giuliani goes, goes, and don't anybody try and say this is anti-Semitic. I'm more Jewish than Soros. <laughs> so Giuliani like is trying... Like an honorary Jew? Like, how does that... <laughs> Giuliani, maybe because the beginning of his last name is Jew. Is that what it is? <laughs> uh, Giuliani is trying to claim that he's more Jewish than a Holocaust survivor uh, is lovely. I mean, that is that is rich. Would we would we call that anti-Semitic? <laughs> <laughs> would we call that anti-Semitic? Uh, anyway, to to go back to the the Bernie Sanders thing. Um, Anyway, I basically I just wanted to sum it up by saying that that he is he is a much more powerful ground game than any of these other candidates, uh, with the possible exception of Biden. But Biden doesn't have the hardcore support the way Bernie Sanders does. Biden's got a bunch of you know sheepish middle of the road, mainly older voters being like, "What else are we gonna do?" Well, I I remember somebody asking, so I can I can. Basically, I can imagine somebody voting for Biden, but actually going out and knocking on doors for him. No, that's not anything <laughs> like, you're going like to see. With, it's like with Hillary. Hillary had yeah. a large number of voters. And if you go off the numbers that we they, they claim are accurate, she got more votes than Donald Trump. But how many yard signs did you see for Hillary? How many yeah. bumper stickers did you see yeah. for Hillary? Not that many compared to Bernie Sanders, compared to Donald Trump. You had a bunch of people sheepishly holding their nose and being like, I guess this is what I got to do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, Bernie Sanders does seem to have this this passionate support in a different way. But we're going to keep seeing all the same tricks. And, and this doesn't mean don't vote. Uh, you and I have said many times that you should still vote. But we're going to see the same tricks. And they're not being talked about, I think, is what's driving me nuts. It's not, I don't need to sit here on this podcast and rehash everything we've already said, except for the fact that they're not being talked about by our mainstream media. They're not even being talked about by a lot of alternative media. And we're going to see the same fucking tricks. Like in California, they're going to do the whole provisional ballot thing again they're going to tell people running these voting sites that if anyone's name is even a moderate question mark if they have a you know if they don't sign their name the same as the signature you have or whatever the fuck just give them if you don't have them them on the list just give them a, a, a provisional ballot and it'll be counted later no it fucking won't no it fucking won't well, and, and for folks who are interested in seeing all of the tricks the Democrats have, I just aired today, also also a bit of a Christmas special. So you did air your grievances. My best of, I did. Uh, the <laughs> air best, your grievances. The best and baddest of 2019, The my, my act out show just aired a best of, and in that- Where should people get that? I'm going to get to that, but I want people to know what they're going to be looking at first. You got you to gotta sell the product before you tell them where the store is. Oh, I, I don't do it that way. I surprise people and hope they don't run away screaming. Oh, see, I'm too honest. I guess that's why I suck as a salesperson. But anyway, here we go. Uh, the one of the One of the episodes that I include a clip of is when I sat down with Nick Branna, who's the founder of the Movement for a People's Party, and he had put together this amazing slideshow that basically outlines the seven ways in which the Democrats are going to steal the primaries again from Bernie or from anybody else uh, that they don't approve of 100%. And not not just using the tactics that they used in 2016, but using tactics that they've fine-tuned or come up with new ones. Uh, and so it's a really eye-opening. And it's great. To, some, some, of, some of this you might already know, but to see it all in one place laid out in the way that Nick lays right. it out is really powerful. Right. So I definitely recommend that folks uh, go see that. You can reach that via freespeech.org uh, or via my website, artkillingapathy.com. 
people should check that out. And but I just think everyone needs to be aware of all these tricks. They're all going to happen again, and there are ways to get active and to try uh, to avoid them, to stop them, um, to you know do your civic due diligence and demand that your vote be counted, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I mean, I, I'm sure I'm going to keep talking about this as the primaries come about. Yeah, because I think we both are. But because I I think that it, it's something that that bears repeating, but also something people need to know how to like. You need to know you have a right to demand that you get a vote that's not a placebo slash provisional vote. I think a big part of this is also just there has to be an ultimatum that's given by the people. Here, you know, like Nick says, here are the seven ways in which the Democrats are going to steal this. Now, chances, I mean, they, they might not steal it if there's enough of a groundswell. But if they do steal it, what do we do as mm-hmm. people? Yeah. Do we do like we did in 2016 and be like, well, that sucks, but OK. Right. Or do we say that sucks? And no, this isn't OK. And we're going to fucking stop you. And however that looks, you know, taking to the streets or what have you. But it's like there has to be an ultimatum because ultimately uh, your vote is only as good as the ultimatum that's given when you cast that ballot. And if you vote and then say, but hey, you know, this is what I think, but whatever you guys, the elites choose is fine also, then why the fuck bother voting? A vote is only as good as that ultimatum that you give. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and and it also helps people get angry and get active to know, to show that this can be predicted, to show that as as with last time around, that these type of things can be predicted, meaning those paying attention know how this system is rigged. And that can help people get more active because they think, oh, this is not just a coincidence. This isn't just like, oh, interesting. This got rigged this time. This is like a regular ongoing thing. Okay, that was our three minutes. Time to move on. <laughs> See, I was trying to tell Lee that he can't tell time. And so that thing <laughs> took about 11 minutes. And uh, Well, as we were saying earlier today, time is in our own consciousness. So it doesn't actually exist outside of us. So to me, that was three minutes. Okay. <laughs> I think what that... Also, I'm a little bit taller than you. So time moves a little, like just a couple of inches uh, faster, is it? Time of... moves a couple of inches faster. Yeah. Like when you're on the top of a mountain, time goes a little slower bit slower or faster. Slower. It goes a little bit faster. However, not the difference between three minutes and eleven <laughs> minutes. So I think in this in this sort of situation, in this example, what we'd call that if everyone says it's eleven minutes and you say it's three, you're just wrong. <laughs> uh like, I disagree, and my temporal existence doesn't matter. Is okay. on a different plane than yours, but I'll, I I'll still definitely agree with that. But I still <laughs> I think will definitely agree. I still think we should go on to the next but you're story. You're on a different plane, uh, and where that plane is headed, no one knows. Oh, by the way, I want to give one more teaser that I forgot to give at the beginning of the show. Uh, by the end of the show, we will teach you how to sit outside in thirty degree weather in shorts, shorts and a t-shirt. And enjoy yourself. <laughs> I like how you say we will teach you. Uh, okay, so this this was this next one came from Fairness and Accuracy Reporting, and of course, this is just one example. But I thought it was so perfect, particularly for this time of year um, when. Please tell me it has a ho 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 pun <laughs> somewhere in it. The in this time of year, of course, there's a lot of uh, holiday shopping, but there's also a lot of shit going on with regards to to politics. Not, of course, least of all the the the, the upcoming elections, but also things like budgets. So, as we've mentioned, uh, three quarters of a trillion dollars was uh, rubber stamped for the Pentagon not too long ago. Uh, but to corporate media, and this is from uh, Fairness and Accuracy Reporting, an exercise bike ad is more newsworthy than that three quarters of a trillion dollars. So, basically, what happened is that. Uh, it, there was some hullabaloo, and I didn't hear about this because I don't... Oh, the Peloton hullabaloo? You didn't hear about it? Oh, I did not hear about oh. the Peloton hullabaloo. Uh, Say that five times fast. <laughs> so, basically, there was a heated, a quote-unquote heated debate 
um, according to folks like the uh, like CBS, uh, there was a heated debate on social media over body imagery in this Peloton ad. But basically, whether it's okay to get a significant other a work a get, get them workout equipment as a gift, basically implying that you need to uh, lose a little weight. Well, not just that, but the fact that she's skinny. She's a skinny mini when she gets the bike. Well, I didn't actually see the commercial, but okay. Oh, I did because I I was curious. Uh, so, so she's she's fucking skinny and pretty ripped when she gets the bike, and then a year passes and she doesn't look any different. <laughs> but the whole point of it is like, oh my gosh, this has meant this exercise bike has changed my life. And on top of that, there's like some 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 questions of uh, of class because. They obviously live in this fucking ginormous house with plenty of room to put in just a giant exercise bike in its own, like, room, basically. Meanwhile, it turns out he started having an affair with a girl who sold him the bike. And uh, <laughs> There's a whole underbelly. There's a whole under not- thing. No, but that, that class thing, and I know we're getting to a different thing in a second, but that class thing is in a lot of these ads where they, like, show someone around the Christmas time, it's time to show up with a car with a giant bow on the top. It's like, when did a car become a fucking Christmas gift? You're supposed to get people like candies and things. And also really figs. wasteful. Yeah, give them fucking figs. Also, Have you some figgy pudding, figgy pudding, figgy pudding. Have you ever had yeah. figgy pudding? It's disgusting. It's that's, like fruit cake. That's not the point. Okay, but... <laughs> you give it to people whether they hate it or not. It's, it's also that really wasteful season. with the bow on the car. Like, <laughs> oh, because yeah, you can't reuse that. Where are you no. going to fucking put that bow? No, you'd have to you'd have to buy some sort of grizzly bear for her next year. And I... I <laughs> but the other thing that I find funny is that, like, because... And I think my, fr- my friends and I were talking about this years ago when, when, when we saw one of those ads, because we all lived in apartments. So hypothetically, let's say that somebody got us a car for Christmas. Not that that would ever happen, but let's say then you'd have to park a car with a bow on it in like the middle of like downtown LA or something and just hope that nobody fucks with it which of course they would well so. I, if you left the bow on it then if, and I were a car thief I would be like that's the car for me it has a fucking bow on it but it's like the the the, the situations have to be so specific for that not just that you have enough money to buy a fucking car for someone, but that, I mean, you got to have like that driveway, the cir- preferably the circular driveway. Oh, yeah. No, it was it was meant for a specific class. It was like, if you don't have the driveway and you don't have the house, then fuck you. You're not getting the fucking car. <laughs> That's what it was. But so this this was not only uh, like pretty fakakt with regards to, to, to body image and uh, in class, but what's really fakakt is the fact that they cared so much. Like, yes, uh, the the issues of body image should be discussed. The issues of class consciousness should definitely be, be discussed. But does that mean that we shouldn't talk about the fact that the Pentagon just got three quarters of a trillion fucking dollars? And the and fairness and accuracy reporting gra- creates this great graph where it shows Peloton coverage and NDAA coverage, which is the, the, the budget where that three quarter of a trillion w- was a part of, and it is it is just mind boggling. Mm-hmm. I mean, so for instance, Fox News, which I know, I know, I know, but <laughs> Fox News, 12, 12 times as much coverage as uh, about the fucking bike than about the military budget. Well, and go on with the others other than Fox News. Uh, so New York Times. Uh, three times as much. Um, Washington Post. Oh, actually, I stand corrected. Washington Post had more coverage about the budget. Well, and then because and this is I think this is part of uh, that the argument too is because the Washington Post owned by Bezos hates Trump. So there's a there's right. a point there there's to basically g- shit on anything that Trump does. Well, and furthermore, actually, I bet you the biggest. Uh, reason behind it is that as we've covered Washington Post did some of their rare actual good reporting where they covered the Afghanistan papers because they have spent three years trying to get those out and the Afghanistan is obviously linked to our ongoing Pentagon budget so without those papers I don't know if they would have covered it that much and not to mention that Amazon has been trying to bag military contracts which are right. which have then been poo-pooed by Trump because he is in a tiff a one percenters tiff with Bezos so there's there's a lot of days of our lives shit happening at the Washington Post. Uh, but every other outlet, LA Times, USA Today, NPR, 
Oh, dear. CNN, NBC, CBS, and ABC all covered the fucking bicycle more than they covered three quarters of a trillion dollars going to the Pentagon. And keep in mind, this is one ad we're talking about. This is not adding up all Christmas time shopping coverage versus nope. Pentagon this is spending. One bike. This is one stationary bike. One stationary <laughs> bike. That that's the thing. They're co- they're covering a bike that's not even going anywhere. I know you're fucking not uh, going to gain any ground. Um, and we're not even saying this. This analysis is not even saying that the coverage was critical of the Pentagon budget. Much of that coverage could have been. Isn't it great that our military is yeah. getting more money? Like you don't know how it's actually covered. But this this gets to a, a larger point, which. I feel like it's a tough one to make because people are so caught up in the day to the day of our media and the day to day of the Trump impeachment minutia and all this stuff that they kind of don't want to admit this. But even if every word our corporate media said were flat out true, which we know is not the case, but even if it were, let's say everything they say is true, their biggest job, their biggest service to covering up our reality is simply to distract you like to tell you that the stories that you're covering are, uh, are, uh, uh, you know, like in the most important things are, are what they're talking about. When in fact, most of the time it's not, they're leaving out things like the Pentagon budget. They're leaving out so many of the stories that you cover on act out all day long are just not mentioned. And I should also point out that uh, fairness and accuracy in reporting notes that even when media did choose to cover uh, the budget, they talked about it. The majority of the outlets focused on the happy part, which is the uh, which Lee and I talked about on the show last week, which was the uh, the the paid family leave for federal workers. Right, right, right. Which, as we noted last week, has no fucking business being in a Pentagon spending bill because that's a domestic fucking policy issue. But it's the only way they, so, the Congress ever passes something positive. So, so most of them completely glossed over the fact that the largest empire the world's ever seen just got a $22 billion boost to their budget. But hey, isn't it nice that federal employees actually get to be parents? That's cool, right? <laughs> so like that, like, like to your point, Lee, about distraction, it's like, you not, not only... Like when you, yes, that was part of the bill. That's true. But you are glossing over the largest part of that bill, which is the largest amount of money that's ever been spent on any military ever since the dawn of militaries. Yeah. So it's like, even if you're not talking about the bike, even if you're talking about the bill itself, you've nitpicked one fucking line of that bill. Uh, Yeah. So... Our media's job is to basically make you care about the things that, even if they're accurate, even if they're moderately important, uh, it's to make sure you aren't caring about the other things. It's to distract you from the reality of our world, to distract you from the the most crucial fights going on in our society, in our planet, and just to, to really not talk about those much. You know, Even if everything they said about climate change were accurate starting tomorrow, uh, they're still covering it one one hundredth the amount they're covering a Peloton ad or whatever the fuck. Yeah, so... Uh... So let's move on to some quick housekeeping and then we'll keep going. Um, as you get to the your end of the year giving, uh, obviously, if uh, you only have a little bit to give, then do not give to us. There are more important things to give to. But if you want to support this show, go to patreon.com slash common censored. Our show has no ads. Nothing is sponsored outside of your donations at patreon.com. You can also uh, you can become, become a member for as little as $1 a month. Uh, sorry, a show. And you can listen to premium content over there as well. And another place uh, you can give, which is very important to um, Eleanor and I is our friend Phil. I always mispronounce the last name. Atato. Atato. Phil Atato. Uh, he's a great activist. He's a great friend. Um, he does. Uh, he's done amazing things. He's worked with Backbone Campaign. Um, anyway, one of the nicest guys we know and have had the honor to work with. And he, in our shitty system, he is now fighting cancer, and he does not have the funds for the medications that he needs because uh, fuck this system, fuck it in the face holes. 
Uh, and so people are donating to, uh, they, they've termed the campaign Keep Phil Alive. So uh, I've created a short link that you can go to his GoFundMe to donate a couple of bucks for him to get the medication he needs. And that is tinyurl.com, T-I-N-Y-U-R-L.com slash keep Phil alive. And we'll include that in the show notes as well. We'll include in the show notes. Uh, if you forget that, tinyurl.com slash keep Phil alive, you can, uh, you can Google GoFundMe Phil Atato, A-T-E-T-O, and you will find it as well. Um... And good good news uh, is that he he is halfway to the goal, so uh, it's doing pretty well. A um, couple other quick notes. Cities uh, I'm coming to, and Eleanor will be joining me in some of them. Uh, Philly, Dallas, Austin, Flagstaff, Arizona, Montreal, Columbus, Ohio, Toronto, and tickets are coming soon for Pittsburgh, Phoenix, Burlington, Vermont, Ottawa, and Asheville, North Carolina. Anyway, as you can tell, a load of cities uh, coming up in the end of winter and spring as part of my book tour and even going into summer. So all of that is at redactedtour.com. If you missed a city I just said or you want to vote for your city to be added, redactedtour.com. It It'll be half book tour, half uh, live stand-up comedy. It'll be a lot of fun. Oh, New York City should also be on there as a uh, upcoming tickets coming soon. Um, and the book is out for pre-order. That's at leecampbook.com if you're looking for a last-minute gift for someone who you forgot to get a gift on uh, Christmas or Hanukkah. Is Hanukkah still going? Yeah, uh, it's eight days because, you know. I know it's eight days, but I don't know when the eight days are. So. <laughs> Such a bad Jew. Uh, uh, terrible Jew. Uh, but anyway, that's at leecampbook.com. You can send us ideas and questions, topics at commoncensored at protonmail.com. And uh, all of Eleanor's work, uh, her videos, her writing, her spoken word, it's all at artkillingapathy.com. And you should subscribe there as well. Yes, please do. I have a newsletter. It's good times. Uh, now on to something that's not good times. It's downright shit times so <laughs> this i saw this remember to keep the christmas spirit in this that's the you promised pa -pa <laughs> you, you promised there'd be a holiday spirit throughout <laughs> gather around children um this little elf wants to tell you about the end of the world <laughs> nice <Yeah>. nice <laughs> this is why i shouldn't have kids um they'd have like severe mental anxiety by the age of six months okay so I saw this article in The Atlantic uh, last week, and yeah, it's rough. So folks are probably well aware of mining operations on land, right? That's something that we, we hear about, whether that be coal mining or mining for precious metals or what have you. What we don't oftentimes think about is mining in the ocean or in the deep sea. So this is something that's been going on for quite some time, but now it's it's moving on to international waters. So today, already many uh, many of the largest mineral corporations already have underwater my underwater mining programs, but the uh, so the quote unquote jewel, if you will, will come when international waters are opened up, which cover more than half of the global seafloor and contain more valuable minerals than all continents combined. Oh, uh, great! Yay. Hold on, but when they do this mining, there's uh, there are no externalities, right? There's no pollution. Well, you know what, Lee, I'm no, so glad uh, you asked because oh, okay. let okay. me let me read this quote from the article. At full capacity, these companies expect to dredge thousands of square miles a year. Their collection of vehicles will creep across the bottom of the ocean floor in systematic rows, scraping through the top five inches of the ocean floor. Ships above will draw thousands of pounds of sediment through a hose to the surface, remove the metallic objects, and then flush the rest back into the water. Some of that slurry will contain toxins such as mercury and lead, which could obviously poison the surrounding ocean for hundreds of miles. The rest will drift in the current until it settles somewhere in nearby ecosystems. Ba -rum -ba -bum -bum. <laughs> um, is an early study shows that each mining ship, each mining ship, will release about two million cubic feet of discharge every day. Enough to fill a freight train that's 16 miles long. 
So considering we're filling the earth, we're filling the earth with, you said flushing it and we're discharging it. uh, We're basically turning the earth into a giant toilet. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, absolutely. But it it, like, imagine if you shit toxic chemicals as opposed to just. You don't know me. I do. (laughs) You you don't know what I'm involved in. (laughs) That's true. I told you not to drink the Pennzoil. Uh, so, and this is, as, as scientists say, this is a conservative estimate, estimate, uh, because there have been other projections that have been three times as high with regards to what, uh, mining ships will release. Um, so basically this will create, and, and folks might be familiar with the, the, the term dead zone, uh, which speaks to the fact that it, it's a zone that's dead in the ocean. Uh, meaning that we've fucked it up to the extent that no life can survive there. And now we want to... A a good example is a large percentage of the Gulf of Mexico is as a dead zone because of uh, our oil spills and everything. Right. Uh, And one of these prime areas that they're looking to is called the Clarion-Clipperton Zone, or CCZ. And it extends across 1.7 million square miles between Hawaii and Mexico, wider than the continental United States. Jesus Christ. Uh, and uh, companies are looking to accelerate their explorations of the CCC to industrial scale extraction. You know what I think would be really nice is if they started factory farming at the bottom of the sea down there. <laughs> they just put a bunch of tortured pigs. You say that like it's a joke, but I wouldn't crates, be surprised. If the they could find the a sea. way to keep the pigs alive in that level, in that pressure level. They, they strap snorkels to their heads <laughs> and then they they pump all the shit out into the ocean. And of course, as as environmentalists on land have uh, have noted, like, for instance, when we talk about frack sand mining, uh, when you pull up all of the silica dust into the air, there's wind and shit that carries it far, far away. Uh, like pixie dust. Like pixie dust on Christmas. On Christmas. Um, and of course, in the ocean, the equivalent would be currents that then carry this toxic sediment far, far away right. from where that mining fucking happened. So you're not just killing the areas that you're mining. You're pulling up that sediment and sending it along its merry way to poison ecosystems far, far away from where you mined. Is there any hope that the... Fish and octopuses will join together in some sort of kind of Aquaman army God, that I hope so. then attack the workers down there. Well, see, here's now you're getting into the comp, like the issue of like the workers and the well. First of all, they're robots because you can't send workers down there because the pressure level at the deep sea is like. All right, attack the robots then. So that would be cool. I'd definitely pay to see some octopuses. octopus v robot battles yeah oh my god there you go hollywood that's your next next blockbuster right there and this this is another good point lee which is a lot of people think about the deep ocean as like debt like it's like a desert right nothing can live that far down because you know the pressure is so extreme and it's so fucking cold uh but the reality of the situation is is that it's actually one of the most uh uh, biodiverse areas that has ever been sampled and this is these is this is coming from scientists in the article who have who have done extensive research in these areas like the mariana trench for example which is the the deepest point uh of in the ocean and it's actually like rife with life like there's a lot you know why because up till now it hasn't had to deal with us i know <laughs> so although the biodiversity is doing although quite this well this guy that the, one of the scientists makes a point that we have in fact already made it down there right he you writes still uh, find occasional he found a bottle. plastic bag at the bottom of one trench a beverage can in another and he saw he saw uh, uh, spam, spam tins budweiser cans rubber gloves and even a mannequin head so how do they know it's not just one guy living down there and that's his trash? With a mannequin head? <laughs> I mean... I'm just kidding. I know there's not a fair guy. Fair enough. I know there's not a guy living down there. They see some guy in his underwear wander out of a cave at the bottom of the trench. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> what y'all doing down here? Um, and th- th- another... <laughs> another, another big part of I've been working on that impersonation for a while. <laughs> is because we we haven't really had the um, the the technology to really study that much down there. What we know about it, the deep sea is actually a lot less than what's probably down there. So, uh, this, this, uh, scientist Drazen makes the point, 
you're removing habitats that took 10 million years to grow. And we don't know whether these these microbes and these uh, organisms can be found anywhere else in the world because we haven't been able to really get down there and explore. And now before science even gets a chance to go down there and be like, whoa, that's really cool. Let's see how we can preserve it. You have mining companies being like, yeah, the fi- I don't fucking care. Let's just destroy it. And this, is, this comes at a time, remember, when we're, deal- we're already dealing with ocean-, ocean acidification, dead zones. So the ocean is already on fucking life support. Yeah. And now on top of that, we want to go ahead and dredge the depths and t- like uh, basically dump a bunch of toxic waste across the expanse of the deep ocean. Yeah, I mean, and so in terms of fighting this, you know, you and I have talked about various front lines fights and things like that. But in a larger scale, I don't think this stuff is going to stop this, you know, complete desecration of the earth without laws that acknowledge like the rights of bodies of water to to have to have rights, <laughs> the rights to have rights, uh, <laughs> the, the, you know, the, that they do have rights and they have rights to protection and things. Yeah. I so think, until those laws change. Well, and as we've discussed on the show too, laws are one thing. Enforcement is another. So hypothetically, let's say, and the other part is that these are international waters. So hypothetically, let's say that, uh, you know, like the, like some, some, some countries in the Pacific, uh, decided to pass laws saying that you couldn't do this. Okay, but what does that mean to that multinational corporation that's in international waters? Who ha- whose, whose decision is that? You know, it's, it, it becomes this legal uh, sort of it's, quagmire. It's just going to be the sea shepherd running around with their stink bombs that they throw on the decks of the ship. I know. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's, we, we need to bring in the sea shepherd on this. The, the sea shepherds, uh, they're going to be the last line of defense. Um, I want to jump to uh, how this has been uh, real quickly, just review, and this is some good news for you because I know you need a <laughs> large, a, a large chaser, a gallon, a gallon jug of chaser after that last story. Um, hey, this- I threw in some parumpa pom poms. <laughs> <sighs> I tried. Listen, your parumpa pom poms are not going <laughs> to cut it <laughs> this time around. Um. The uh, this uh, you know a quick uh, quick review of the year that the, we want to mention that this has been a year of workers fighting back uh, in a lot of different ways in a lot of different countries and we're not going to name them all right now but some of the biggest ones were the the yellow vests and uh, combined with the French strikes that are happening right now uh, the French are talking about a general strike they've already had strikes across many different uh, areas that have completely interrupted French life but. That's what you need to do when you have a fucking government and a neoliberal idiot at the top who is wants to interrupt life in general, uh, you know, forcing people to work many more years to earn their pensions. So uh, if he's going to interrupt all, all of their lives, then it makes sense. You should interrupt life to stop it and and force him to reverse course, force them to reverse course. Um, teacher strikes we've had in the U.S., many of them achieving large gains. Uh, of course, there's been the fight for 15 going on. There was a very large, one of the largest in uh, decades or over a decade, uh, GM strike, 48,000 uh, United Auto Workers involved in that. So big, big, uh, big worker movements going on. Yeah, I think I think it's incredibly powerful that we that we recognize this and and give it a a mention because in particular in the U.S. because the the U.S. has had its labor movement absolutely uh, pummeled and <laughs> to, within an inch of its life, uh, you know that there's there's a, a a very rich history of striking and I, I just finished reading a um, a biography about Voltaire Declare who was a who was a very fascinating anarchist that uh, was active around the same time as Emma Goldman and Alexander Berkman and uh, the Haymarket riots. I mean, hell, we had a hell of a fucking 
there was a, a, a big surge of labor organizing and anarchist slash socialist communist uh, powerful leftist organizing happening around the turn of the century in 1900. And that has really, really been beaten back thanks to, in large part, McCarthyism. And again, as we all know, we're seeing that happen again. And in spite of that, we're seeing a lot of folks organizing in their workplaces uh, and, and, and really fighting back and kind of uh, reigniting and reconnecting with that radical past. And we should really support that and amplify it and, and use that and, and bring that kind of mentality to our own workplaces and you know, lo- looking at France, seeing how we can overcome differences in order to work together to really harness the power that we as workers have th- across industries. Beautifully said. And uh, I think they'll keep growing next year. I don't think we've seen the end of them. You haven't seen the last of us. Not to mention we're on, as you and I mentioned, the cusp of a uh, giant recession, if not depression, uh, once this bubble bursts that's been going on far longer than we thought. And uh, I think that will force workers and people to stand up again. Let's move forward to uh, what do you want to jump to? I think we should uh, go to your your special, your Christmas special. Your Christmas special special topic. My Christmas special special topic. <laughs> uh, I suppose it is it is good for a for a bit of a lighter fare in a way because it is a, a positive analysis. A po- it's also a bit of a life hack. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of good things. <laughs> is it a life hack. I thought that was like using a tube of toothpaste to like to get gum out of your hair or something. I know, yeah, I thought that was a life hack. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't really make sense, but someone did it. Did it. Uh well, uh being surviving, I consider a life hack. <laughs> Finding yeah, places fun. All right, so I am not the first to talk about this. These these documentaries and various things have been seen by millions of people, so uh maybe I'm even late to the game. But I thought this would be a fun conversation to have. Anyway, uh I saw there are many things have been done on him. He was on Joe Rogan. His name's Wim Hof. He's, he's, oh, he has all the, anytime you've seen these things about Guinness Book of World Records, uh, longest time in a block of ice, longest time under the ice, longest in time. In a block of ice? Well, I'm, I'm kidding around, but he, okay. they, they did cut, he looked like he was in a block of ice. They cut a whole a massive hole in the ice covered lake and, uh. Well, well, I mean, massive as in thick. The the ice on this lake was very thick, and he went in and stayed in for like over an hour or something. Um, Chile. <laughs> Chile. <laughs> but here's the thing. So I, I've seen all those things before, too, uh, or various, you know, ice records, and they didn't seem to have anything to do with me. Like, it's just, a, it's a fascination. Wow, this guy's really good at sitting in ice. Uh <laughs> it, it's like, all right, that's a thing he does. You know, it's like when you see a marathon runner ran a two-hour marathon. You don't think about what that has to do with you. You just think, wow, that guy's fast. That's what I thought. Um, but I saw one where he took a, tr- a group of people uh, that had never met him before and not trained with him or anything. And they did the uh, – one of the things he takes people he's training is a, a two-hour uh, walk in the snow up a mountain – uh, in, uh, ne- you know, uh, sub freezing temperatures in only shorts, no shirt. Uh, oh, and shoes. So shorts and shoes, <laughs> shorts and shoes. And like uh, flip flops or and like-, like a tiny little elf hat. No, I'm kidding. No, no <laughs> elf hat, no elf hat allowed. Uh, but so he had not trained these people except for like one day and they did this, they achieved this walk. Uh, and it made me realize that like, oh, it's not just something he can do. This is being able to deal with the cold in and not just it's also not just being like I'm not cold I'm not cold I'm not cold <laughs> it's uh you know he's got some various things like you some heavy breathing that he says uh, oxygenates the cells and things um but also for me it was kind of just realizing that the sensors that cue your brain to think you're cold are not really accurate. You just feel your fingertips get cold and you think, oh, I'm cold. Or you feel a, a chill on your skin and you think, oh, I'm cold. You're not really. You're feeling a chill on your skin, but your core is not cold. And uh, anyway, so I started uh, walking outside in the cold and uh, it's fun. <laughs> well, that's okay. You have to expound on that. But I do. I, I want to take, take a second because it's interesting that you're talking about like, well, you're not really cold. Well, so evolutionarily speaking, it's interesting that 
you would send you you send messages to your brain saying you, you know your fingers are cold. And if you have the ability to... You mean your fingers send messages to your brain. Yes, sorry. That you have the ability to compartmentalize and, say, and and when you actually think about it, okay, well, yes, my fingers are cold, but I'm fine. Uh, so it's interesting, like, evolutionarily speaking, like, how how we've evolved to right. a point of, of comfort in you know, yeah. our modern day. Extreme comfort, Where yeah. as soon as our fingers are cold, we're like, I'm cold. Right, right. <laughs> when, like, obviously, as, you know, as cave dwellers, you know, 40,000 years ago, that was not going... That's not how you would have interpreted those messages uh, about your fingers being cold. You yeah, would have been like, oh, okay, my fingers are cold. Uh, okay, whatever. If you, ev- if, if you even registered that right. information. Right. Well, you you know, we're all watching these, uh, you know, period pieces and stuff on Netflix and Game of Thrones and where they all live in old rock castles with no heating. And you're kind of like, how do these people get through the winter? We're talking months at a time where they're just inside a stone slab of shit <laughs> and it's freezing and you can see their breath for months. <laughs> and it's because, yeah, I bet their fingers were cold, but that's not... It doesn't really matter in but the scope gonna of things. But they're going to be okay. They're going to be okay. Um, because your core temperature isn't really lower. But And I'm sure some people are wondering uh, what this has to do with a- anything. Um, but I wanted to use this as an in to the power of the mind to... It, it, the it powerful feel, computer. It feels like we have a lot of capabilities as humans that we most of us are not really... Uh, attempting or pushing the limits or trying. Uh, so the another thing that this guy has done, and he took some of his students as well, um, was they had a a, a virus. I can't remember the exact name, but a virus uh, in, injected into their blood, an infection, and they, as a group, showed less um, symptoms of the. They basically didn't get sick, whereas. Uh, Everyone else, basically, who has this gets sick, uh, and they didn't have hardly any symptoms. And it, it has, you know, it has to do with a combination of the, the, the strategies and the and and the you know the the power of the mind to uh, fight off infection. And uh, a- anyway, I'm I, I just think it's it's there's a lot of power to our to our. Uh, you know, for our health in terms of, and speaking of our, about our health uh, in the mind that we kind of never tap into. And, you know, that can also go back to how we are expected to only think of the big pharma, big healthcare uh, industry as the only way to ever help us or cure anything or, uh, you know. I'm curious when it comes to the, the, to the virus thing, how did he address that? Like, I mean, I'm assuming he didn't just sit there and meditate for like, the uh the period that a virus gestates or whatever however long that is like i'm assuming he went about his day i'm yeah i didn't so the part of the little documentary that i watched or whatever was on that part was very short uh so i don't actually know how he dealt with it but i do know that you know the same breathing exercises he says uh activate the adrenaline which adrenaline helps you fight things um, and so if you're just sitting calmly in a hospital room dealing with your illness, you're really never activating that adrenaline. Mm. Um, so I do think that's part of it. I think another part of it is that because he and the people he had trained uh, spend a lot of their time, probably at least once a day, pushing their bodies to this brink of kind of, you know, where you get a fight or flight instinct and there's no, and they've decided not to flight. They've decided not to leave, leave the cold circumstances so their body gets the uh, ability to fight back you know kind of trained into it beaten into it it's like you are training your body to fight with these things the same way a fighter may train its body their body to fight and uh, deal with adrenaline and everything Um, well and and i do know that i mean they've had and this has gotten spun into some sort of like sick twisted capitalist always be happy bullshit but really they're, they've done several studies that show that your mental health dictates your physical health to a large degree. And that's not to say that you should always be happy because that's fucking certifiable. That's not mental health. But the idea that you're... <laughs> that's, men- that's mental instability. No, that's yeah. called Stepford Wives. Um, that, so, but like the idea that, you know, people who... 
people who suffer from depression, for instance, like very uh, like severe depression, are more likely to be physically or physically sick as well. On top of being on top of feeling emotionally and mentally ill, so the fact that your 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 brain dictates so much of your physical well being, and you we we've talked about this on the show too. I, I think that this idea of priming, like if you're for instance, if you visit your grandmother at uh, you know at hospice or something, and you're there for like two hours, you leave and you're just you just feel tired and you feel older and you just. You know, it's like your body takes on, particularly with somebody who's empathetic, your body takes on these, uh, these, these feelings, like in a, in a deep way, not just like, oh, that's a bummer, but like you actually start physically feeling it. Right. One of the tests they did, and, and I've just, and anecdotally, I've, I've felt it myself, but one of the tests they did is, uh, you know, if you, if you saw an infirm person walk by, uh, and they did this test thousands of times, people walk slower and you know behave more slowly uh they're less mentally acute and if you the reverse is true if you're around people that are really high active uh mentally active then you uh behave that way as well and uh i've just anecdotally i've like you know i'm like back when my grandmother was alive seeing her in her nursing home or whatever you feel yourself start to slow down like you feel your you you you're walking at a slower pace just subconsciously. It's you've been primed to to go a little slower. Yeah, and of course this this leads to deeper conversations about like of course how things like solitary confinement affect you not just mentally but physically like your body actually starts to break down and you get mm-hmm. sicker easier and things mm-hmm. like that and uh y- so I mean the 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 connection between your mental well being and your physical well being is 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 very clearly documented and researched and uh, so obviously there's that side of it and then there's sort of like the 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 philosophical sort of privileged aspect about talking about how, how it could be easier for you to walk outside when it's cold you know this but it's it's still it's from the same core concept of our brains being these incredibly powerful computers. And uh, their ability to dictate our physical well-being and how we perceive our physical state is is fucking impressive. And in terms of to go back to like uh, p- being sick, and and you notice, you know, we all see in our lives there are some people we know that seem more seem sick more often. Um, when they get sick, it seems to last longer, and there can be a lot of uh, psychological reasons for that. Uh, this is. It does not mean they are making up their illness. People people often confuse those that that they'll think th- that something can have a psychological cause, uh, and and therefore it means they're not actually ill. But as I'm saying with uh, you know Wim Hof and his students, that they were injected with a real virus. So technically, they had a real virus in them. Uh, by the way, I could be fucking up using the word virus. Maybe it was something else, but I think it was a virus. Um, but uh, but then using their minds and, and certain behaviors that they were doing w- with their minds, they were able to fight off the symptoms. So it goes to show that, yes, in reality, they didn't create the sickness that they fought off. It was real. Um, and it for people that are often very sick, it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy where you... Uh, feel sick more often. You get down about being sick. You aren't very active because you're feeling sick. Uh, then the combination of those things means you can't fight off stuff as easily. You are not, uh, you know, very active or working out or whatever. You're, uh, you know, mentally you're not very happy or healthy, and all these things can kind of feed on each other. Now this is. I'm also, but I think people can view the world as black and white and they'll be like, that means anything can be fought off with positive thinking. <laughs> and it's like, no, it's, it's the tr- the reality, the truth is somewhere in the middle where s- behaving a certain way and thinking a certain way can help fight off some of these things. But, and, but some of them are obviously, you know, you could be the best, most positive thinker in the world. You have a brain tumor, you got a brain tumor. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go away. <laughs> like, well, and I also think that we, we should differentiate between, you know, just positive thinking right. and powerful right. thinking. Because I right. think, like, right. what what this guy's talking about and what you've talked to me about uh, outside the podcast when you've been doing these exercises, 
in the cold is the idea that it's it's about powerful you're not sitting out there being like god i love the cold you're out right there. it's not positive thinking yeah yeah right, I, it's, it's, i shouldn't even be using the it's term powerful positive. thinking yeah, and yeah. i think like just like you've you've talked about on your show this this bastardization of mindfulness that, yep. that capitalism has created the mindfulness industry where it's like just buy this yoga mat and all of this accoutrement and you will be mindful too like as if you can buy your way <laughs> if you just hit your head over your <laughs> Hit, hit yourself over the head with a yoga mat. You should be fine. Yeah. <laughs> but it has to be like the two hundred dollar yoga mat. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not going to work. But it has I, to be a. If you run headlong into a Peloton machine, <laughs> you'll be fine. Oh my god, I really want to see that happen. Uh, but like, I, and I think that that's where it's important that because I feel like people can easily. Uh, misconstrue it right. not just in terms of like oh yeah well if you just think positively then then everything will be fine but right. people might also think that uh, you know this is this is just something that capitalism has taken control over and therefore completely skip over trying to do this for themselves and mm-hmm. and qu- kind of testing out the power of our brain which is powerful outside of the confines of capitalism. It's just that capitalism will then try to take that and, and, you know, like turn it into like, Oh, here, rent out this ice box for $50 an hour. And you too can be powerful. It's like, no, (laughs) I can just fucking walk outside, do this breathing exercise and like, think about, and you use my brain for fucking free. And that, and then there's sort of like, and, and in that, also start start to to you know i'm getting a little bit into the weeds here but part of that is also really thinking outside of the confines of how we're programmed this day and age right. you know and 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 using these sort of exercises to think and, you know, just to, to, to kind of contemplate about the power of our minds and not just our own bodies, but kind of outside of ourselves and in a, like in a society type uh, type paradigm and, and beyond our our own bodies. And for those, you know what you just made me think about it for those who, who think who are like, well, this still sounds pretty, uh, pretty ridiculous. You can't just. You can't just think you're not cold when you're cold. And for for those people, I'd say what I kind of figured out is when you're cold, you're also thinking you're cold. Like mm-hmm. like it's actually the power of the mind that can make that makes you cold. So it's it's like I said earlier, the signals of your fingertips or your toes and or a chill down your neck, and then you think, Oh my god, I'm so cold, I gotta get inside. But you're not actually that cold. You've just put yourself in that place because you you're accustomed to those signals, those uh, early signals, meaning I'm very cold. Um, and so, so it's the reverse too. It's, it's, it, it, you can, you can in a lot of ways, think you're, think yourself out of being very cold, but you can think yourself into being cold of a cold too. Well, so. and it's sort of a, it, it's, it, it's a self-fulfilling prop, prop, bleh, wow. Pro- property. Prop, 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 prop. There we go. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, and that like for anybody who's ever been cold, or for me, for me it's really hot because I I can do cold even when I'm even when I acknowledge that I'm fucking cold. I can hang in there but when I'm hot. I go from zero <laughs> to bitch real fast. <laughs> yeah, and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy because then all all I can do is sit there and be like, oh my god, it's so hot. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> and that's like basically all I do, and I become a whiny little bitch. And I could, <laughs> I should start ex- like exercising and being like, okay, I'm you know whatever breathing exercise you do to make yourself cooler. I don't know, but I, I should, I should start practicing that in, instead. And I mean, I'm, I'm having a hard time even saying this because just the it idea makes you so angry. of sitting in the heat on purpose to try and make myself colder sounds absurd to me so in ter- heat so much so but in terms of the self something my mind could do because it right. is that fucking powerful right so in terms of the self appealing prophecy you probably feel some of the the hints that you are hot such as i've i've noticed anytime you get like a trickle of sweat like on your upper lip or something you are immediately miserable <laughs> you've decided it's 900 degrees and uh, and I think so. Those early signs that you're getting hot in your mind mean you're now boiling. You're now blood is boiling, all is lost. It is emergency fight or flight time. 
Um, so yeah, yeah it, 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 it would, which is, which is kind of the brain doing the reverse of what it should do to deal with heat. It's, it's telling, it's instead telling you fucking get the fuck out of here. But I think this is interesting because we've had, we've had this conversation too, because I, we both played sports in the South. I played softball in, in North Carolina and you played tennis in, in Virginia. Although I went to tennis camp in Tampa, Florida, which, which is, I think that should be child abuse actually. Awful. Uh, I think the statute of limitations is over for you to sue your parents, but I'm just saying for future reference. <laughs> uh, but so I, th- like I would play and I was a pitcher, which means that you're, there's no, I'm, you're just standing on the mound in the blistering fucking sun. And, <laughs> <clears throat> and as Yogi Berra said, I think it was 90% of pitching is 50% mental or something. But it's, it's basically like you have to be in your own head the entire time because you're constantly playing the strategy game with a batter and checking people on base and everything like that. You can't drift off into La La Land. So it's, it's heavy work, but I don't look back at that and think, oh, fuck, I was miserable the whole time. Because in those moments, I was so focused on the pitch, I was focused on the game, that my brain didn't have enough capacity to also be like, fuck me, it's hot. Right. The fuck me, it's hot was when I was in the dugout or in between games, yeah. and then I was like, eh. Yeah, no, I was, I was the same way, even though I'm better at dealing with heat than you are. Uh, I would, if I had to sit in the sun... I was utterly miserable. I mean, I continue to be utterly miserable if I have to sit in the sun, <laughs> but uh, on a hot day. But I could play tennis or play a sport in the sun and not not really feel it's that hot. Or even if I felt it was hot, I kind of liked it. Uh, I was like, oh, well, you know, this is a this is a good workout here or something. Whereas if you just stand me somewhere, if I'm in line <laughs> for something in the heat in the sun, I will kill everyone. You'll so. never see Lee at Disneyland in yeah. June, folks. Oh, that's the worst. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's also, uh, and and folks who have done any kind of training, uh, I used to be a personal trainer. This is something that that you deal with a lot, the power of the mind. It's like, oh, I can't do one more rep. Yes, you can. Your body will not quit until your mind tells it to. I mean, obviously there is there is a point of, of you know, injury and, and whatnot, but for the most part, if you're inside of your ability, your physical ability, you can do one more rep. You can do right. 15 more seconds on the treadmill. It's just right. that your brain is like, I'm tired, this hurts. Or I'm bored or whatever. And that's why you stop. But if you force your brain just like, you know, they do in uh, in a lot of in, in a lot of sports, you get, you know, quote unquote that runner's high or you get in the zone where you could just keep doing reps. Uh I, and maybe we could keep giving examples for hours, I'm not sure here. But uh I remember hearing a like a radio documentary thing about um the best times in marathons, and I think it continues to this day, but this may have been five or eight years ago, but almost exclusively come from a, like the top world athletes in marathons, uh, from a small area of Africa. I can't remember whether it was Ethiopia or Kenya, Kenya, um, Kenya, but, and they were trying to figure out why it is that so many of these, because obviously there's elite runners all over the world. So why is it that these, that this group, this, this, uh, you know, area of people are so good at running and they did find that, okay, well they did, you know, run to school as kids, you know, the, sometimes it'd be a, a 20 minute, half hour run or several miles or school or whatever. But more than that, what they found was that in these tribes in certain areas, Dealing with pain was a key uh, uh, rites of passage, um, as a, especially as a young man, although I think young women as well. But where the kids were training themselves to deal with this rites of passage pain uh, ceremony for a long time. They would, even as little six and eight year olds, they'd whip their legs with twigs and branches and in order to deal with the pain. So, well, not, I don't know if I'm on not only that. did that, not only did that. <laughs> evolved so that the people who could deal with pain most were the most successful in the society, probably having the most kids. So you're slowly over thousands of years evolving a a group of people that can deal with pain a lot better. But on top of that, they're probably the successful ones in that rites of passage are associating pain with Yes, I'm tough. I'm strong. I'm appreciated by my fellow human beings in this tribe or area. And and all of those things come together for them to be able to push through mentally 
uh, a breaking point that your average person cannot. There's so much to unpack there. And I know that we're like already over time, but maybe we can continue this conversation, the extra content, but like, so there's the, there's the, there's like the sort of toxic uh, obsession with pain there that like, I don't think is a good thing. Right. We shouldn't be. I mean, I cut myself. You're saying you don't. <laughs> or So uh, like we shouldn't be obsessed with it like in 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 that le- on that in, in that sense right because i think this leads to no the i was just giving it, of it i was giving but, an example no, 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 no. but the i think power of the mind it's, it's also interesting because of that aspect and you and i have talked about like how discomfort is how we progress it's how we evolve uh comfort is the antithesis of change right and so if you want to change mentally physically emotionally it's going to be uncomfortable or create change right it's going to be uncomfortable there's going to be growing pains there's going to be shit that yeah that you don't enjoy and so i think that like there's, you know, it's it, it's kind of a spectrum, I guess. There's like the one side of it where it's like, oh my gosh, everything should be comfortable and happy all the time. And then there's like the other side of it, which is like, you know, the sort of, I am Sparta or whatever the fuck, like where it's like, you're not cool unless you've like lived through a hundred lashings or whatever the fuck. Like there's like the, the, the space in between the two that I think is, it, it, and of course I don't believe in like the happy balance either, but that idea that like, well, life to a certain extent, not to quote Princess Bride, but I'm going to, life is pain. (laughs) And anyone who says different is selling something. Let's say that. (laughs) Everything you need to know about life you can learn from (laughs) Princess Bride. Bride. But I think like there's truth to that, right? Not that we always have to be in pain. And I think we also have to acknowledge that a lot of our pain is based on our system. So like you pointed out with, with our good friend, Phil, he shouldn't have to be in pain because of our stupid fucking system. We have the ability Mm -hmm. as a society to make sure everybody has their health taken care of Mm -hmm. at the same time. We can't and shouldn't ever live in a totally pain-free society. Stepford wife esque because that's fucking terrifying. And it would also be stagnant. Stagnation is death. Right. And as you said earlier, we there's a lot to unpack in that. Um, but I will say, I think because we've combined a bunch of conversations here, uh, the dealing with cold I was talking about was not me sitting out there being like, I love pain. <laughs> so no? it's, a, it's a little bit different <laughs> no, than know. that. It's a little I bit know. different than that. We, we went off into the yeah, yeah, yeah. leads and into the deserts of Kenya. I don't really know. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, and the last thing I want to say, because I did start to mention it earlier, but I think the reason you don't hear more talk about the, the, the power of the mind to cure certain things, the power of the mind to deal with certain things is because it just doesn't make enough money. I mean, sure, someone can sell tickets to his class about the power of the mind, but that's not big pharma. That's not no. big health insurance. Right. That's not your average doctor. And a, co- a combination of it doesn't make big money and your average doctor is not being trained in it. Uh, and so, also, as you noted, there are some things that you can't think your way out of. Like if you, of have, course, of course, of course, of course. Yeah. But just like you know, it's a it's a tool. Like Tylenol is useful, but that doesn't mean Tylenol can bring a dead hooker back to life. That's a <laughs> that's a David Tell joke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tylenol does not do everything it does certain things the power of the mind does, doesn't do everything it does certain things but uh, the final thing I want to say is that that stuff is even suppressed and increasingly so online I mean I just had a guest on uh, talking about she's not the one that revealed it but talking about the uh, the leak from inside Google that showed that one of the terms or a couple of the terms on their black list of terms that are basically just they're not blacked out they're just suppressed so you won't find them easily is cure for cancer Mm -hmm. like this is the type of thing that our search engines online etc are not telling us and so these a lot of treatments or cures that are not the regular kind are being heavily suppressed absolutely uh, I wanted to go through a couple of uh, quick things I mentioned earlier that that the, the Phil, uh, the web address for Phil to go and donate a couple of bucks um, to help our good friend get his cancer meds is Tiny Earl, T-I-N-Y-U-R-L, not E-A-R-L. <laughs> I do not know a tiny Earl. I've never met a tiny Earl. Most Earls I know are very large. 
uh, tinyurl.com slash keep Phil alive. That's what they named the GoFundMe. That's not me being fucking ridiculous. tinyurl.com slash keep Phil alive. Uh, also, uh, we're going to head over to Patreon, do a little more content. That's at patreon.com slash common censored. And because the city list has gotten much longer, I'm going to go through it again. I'm coming and Eleanor's joining me in some of these cities, Philly, Dallas, Austin, Flagstaff, Montreal, Columbus, Ohio, Toronto, and c- coming tickets soon are Pittsburgh, Phoenix, Burlington, Vermont, Ottawa, Asheville, North Carolina. All of it's at redactedtour.com, and you can vote for your own city there. Am I missing anything? I, I mean, that, that was a long list. I don't know. I suggest you go to leecamp.com if you're curious. <laughs> <laughs> and for more on, on my work, go to artkillingapathy.com. Keep fighting. Thank you for 2019. See you next decade. Act out.